Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here today. It's always a great way to start a service is to remember what Jesus has done for us. By the way, for those of you that might be new, we do that once a month. We do that the very first Sunday of the month. So uh, feel free to join us. And for anybody who's put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we welcome you to come and um, to take of the Lord's Supper and to remember him. Glad to see you guys all here today. How's everybody doing? I'm okay. Thanks for asking. I'm all right. I, uh, we had a picnic yesterday. So I'm a, I'm a little redder than usual and much sore in my back. So uh, I won't be doing any cartwheels for today. I know you're disappointed because that would be amazing since I don't do them. So... We're back in the book of Genesis today, and we're going to carry on with Joseph and looking at his life. Uh, first thing I want to bring up is, uh, how many of you know that it's going to be the 4th of July this week? You... Okay, not all of you. Okay. Um, that's, that's a test of your response to this emergency broadcast system. If it was an actual emergency, you'd be... No, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's 4th of July. I'm wondering... How many of you have served in the military? I'd like to see you stand up. Amen. Thank you, men, for your service. I didn't see any women, but it could happen. It's important to remember that the freedom that we enjoy so freely wasn't free. And there were many people that sacrificed for little things like our constitution, democracy, our way of life, living in a republic where we get to elect officials to office to vote for us. Like it or not, we vote them in. It could be a whole lot worse. You could be in Russia or you could be in China. Or you could be living in South Africa, where if you're a Christian, you run the risk of losing your life for saying yourself, or meeting in a public place to call in the name of the Lord. So we have much to remember, uh, so much more than burgers and hot dogs. We, we have a wonderful freedom that we enjoy and don't think of and take for granted very often, and yet God has blessed us to be here. And the amazing thing is the scripture teaches us that he has picked us to live in this time in this place. In Paul's sermon, as he's speaking in the book of Acts and he's in uh, Corinth, he's speaking at the Areopagus and he says, God has chosen us to live in the particular time that we live in, in the particular place in which we live. So I can't complain about New Jersey too much because God put me here. Pray with me this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here to look into your word for us to be spiritually fed so much more than a novel, so much more than a story is your revealed interactions with human beings throughout the years. And I pray that you help us as we look at your word that we would see it as it is, that it's your communication to us. Lord, I pray that you speak to every heart here today, including my own, that we might know you better that we might know what it is you would have us do for you so that we might serve you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Lord, we dedicate this time to you and pray that you would bless us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. We've been looking at the training of Joseph and everything that he went through, believe it or not, is getting him to the place where he's qualified to hold a position where he's suddenly been promoted to the second in charge of all the known world in Egypt. And it's interesting how he had to go through all of these things. And as you look through these tests, you yourself have probably had to be through these things because God works the same in all of us. We're all made of the same stuff, right? Just like temptations, there's nothing new that's under the sun. We all suffer temptation in some way, shape or form, either from the devil or from the world or from the flesh. And here's all of the ways in which he was tested. And as we look at his life, you, you might find that you fall into those categories because God uses these things to breed character in our lives. 
And so we've seen Joseph go through all these things. Last week, we were in chapter 41, where he finally comes before Pharaoh, even after two long years where he told the baker when he was in prison, hey, listen, this is what's going to happen. Pharaoh's going to take you back in three days. When he does that, I want you to remember me when you come before Pharaoh because I'm unfairly treated. I'm not supposed to be here in prison. I was accused of things that I didn't do. And if you could put a word in for me, boy, I'd really appreciate it. I jersified it for you. But that's essentially what he's saying. And after two years, he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. He just completely forgot him. It's easy to remember people when they do you a favor, and it's easy to forget after. And it's just the way that it is. It's like what causes us to go to our knees in prayer when we have difficulties and hardships. We go to the Lord when we have needs, like a fire extinguisher. We should really go to him daily, moment by moment. And then we won't have that long break in relationship. And so what he does is he sends Pharaoh a dream, or I should say a nightmare. He sends him a nightmare. So he's standing by the river and he sees this incredible vision. God gives him this horrific nightmare for a reason. He sees, you know, these six good fat cows that are, you know, well fortified, very well fed. And then he sees these six or seven rather um, animals that are uh, undernourished and dying. These, these zombie looking cows, the way they're explained. And he, he doesn't know what it is. And then suddenly it just makes him wake up. And trying to shake off the dream, he goes back to sleep and he has another dream. That's very similar to the other one. He has these stalks that, that rise up and these beautiful, fruitful stalks, which is a symbol of um, profitability. Obviously, if you're in a country, you have to have food and they're doing exceptionally well. And then there are these other stalks that rise up and they actually devour the other ones. And so he, he wakes up from that and he goes, what in the world does all this mean? I need somebody to interpret it for me. And then all of a sudden the butler says, oops, I suddenly remember two years ago, there was a guy, I know a guy, I know a guy in prison. Oh, I bet you do. He knows a guy in prison that interpreted his dream and did it correctly, exactly like it was going to be. Because he said to me, God is the interpreter of dreams. And God used him to interpret our dreams exactly as they were supposed to be. So the butler says, oops. Immediately, Pharaoh says, bring him here. And so they clean him up. Obviously, they don't have the most hygienic situation in jail. So they clean him up, shave his head. And uh, before going before Pharaoh, you got to look, you know, you got to look good. And here's, here's Joseph's interview, if you will. It's his one shot at getting out of jail, right? But he doesn't see it as that. He sees it as an opportunity to serve the living God. And he's not going there uh, full of desperation, full of, oh no, I better make this good. I better put on a good performance. He still gives God glory and he points to God and he says, God is the one who will give you an answer, Pharaoh. And so he's always giving God glory, never takes any for himself. What a great example. And it's certainly an example of what Jesus did when he came, how he didn't take any, he says, I don't do anything of my own accord. I only do what the father tells me. And it's just this wonderful humility that, that comes in both places. And so Pharaoh explains to him the dream again. And he says, this is, this is what I had with the, the cows. And this is what I had with the stalks. And he says, listen, the dreams that you had are one dream. God is trying to tell you what he's about to do. The, the first bunch are going to be lean or are, are going to be good. And those are the years we're going to have some really good years that are coming up but we're also going to have famine that comes afterwards. And the famine is going to be so great that it gobbles up any of the benefit that you've had from the last previous years of plenty. And so Pharaoh says, well, what am I going to do? What, what, what am I going to do? And Joseph, without even being asked, actually tells him what to do. He says, what you need to do is find somebody who's a good manager Somebody who knows what to do in situations like this. And what you do is double taxes for the next seven years. Make sure you collect twice as much. So take 20% from people in these years of plenty. It's not hard to, to get taxed when you have money, right? It's when you don't have money that's hard. That's why, a you know, taking a percentage of your pay would be great. Just a flat tax. Don't you think that'd be a good idea? I think it'd be great. 
So if you make little, you pay little. If you pay a lot, I mean, that's the whole principle, right? You, you pay your share. And so he says, collect in advance and make sure you store it up and make sure that it's ready for those lean years or you're going to get stuck. And he goes, well, that's, that's a really great idea. I can't think of anybody who's better for the position than you, Joseph. And so he puts fresh linen clothing on him, which is a sign of royalty. He puts a ring on his finger, which means he has authority. They would melt wax and seal things so that they would, they would know it came from the person. Because, you know, there are forgers out there, and, you know, signatures, nothing. But if there's only one of a kind ring that makes that imprint. He gives him his signet ring and he gives him a, he gives him a new chariot, right? It's the number two chariot, you know, the Lamborghini that he's, that he's got parked in the garage. And so he, he gives him all of that and he suddenly has this new life and he's in charge. And so Pharaoh says, get at it. Make sure that we have enough food when the famine comes. So he's suddenly promoted. He, he gets all authority over all the geography. He gets recognition. He gets new fashion sense. He's got a new ride. He's looking good. A couple of interesting things. He gives him a new name. By the way, did you know that you're going to be given a new name? Whatever, whatever name your parents hung upon you, that's, that's going to go away once you enter heaven. You're going to get a new name. It says that you're going to get a stone. In case you forget, you're going to get a stone with your new name on it, and nobody's going to know it except the Lord and you. You should read it. The book of Revelation. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I know. I didn't say that last week, so sorry about that. Anyway, I, I tend to go off. Forgive me. So he gets this new name which uh, they have several interpretations, but essentially it means he's the savior of the world. He's the one who speaks as God. Okay, it's interesting because Jesus follows that line too, doesn't he? The savior of the world. And he gets a wife, ta-da! A beautiful wife who's really hooked up politically. She's the daughter of the priest of On. Yeah, his name actually means gift of Ra or the one who's given by Ra. So, uh, and he's forced to marry her. Gee, sorry I interpreted your dream, Pharaoh. <laughs> and you say, well, I thought the Jews weren't supposed to intermingle with the Gentiles or anybody else. And that's true. But Jesus has a Gentile church, which is a Gentile bride, isn't it? So I don't think it's such a bad idea. I'm not going to judge Joseph. So, and, he, and her name's Azanath, which, which means the one who's from Nath. But anyway, He's 30 years old when he stands before him, and he, Jesus happens to be 30 years old when he begins his ministry. Isn't that a wonderful coincidence? And so Joseph is then sent out into the world, and he becomes an architect. He's going to build all these silos. And by the way, they still exist to this day, and you can see them. Not very far south from Cairo is where they exist. I've got some pictures up here so we can all go on the trip together. So this week, we're going to finish the last 10 verses I wasn't able to finish last week. Now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. And so he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and he laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city food of the fields, which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea. And he, he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. And Joseph and to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Padipfera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, or Manasseh if you're in Hebrew, for God has made me forget all the toil and of all my father's house. And the name of the second was called Ephraim, and God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt, ended. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. The famine was in all the lands, but in the land of Egypt, there was bread. And so when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And then Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries 
came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. And so that's it. That's the last 10 verses. So thank you for coming. I don't know about you, but if, if you're like me, you've read the Bible more than once, and so you go through stuff like that, and you go, okay, facts, names, okay, years, okay, got it. Next page. How many of you read that way? Only Sue. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Sue, you, and I'll, I'll talk to you then, Sue. It's so easy to be able to go through the Word of God, and especially if you're on a plan. If you're on a plan, it's one of those things where you just... I got to get through it, man. I'm running behind. I've missed yesterday. I got to catch up. So it's I've had Joseph and Azam and two children, Manasseh, and there's Ephraim. And, okay, and then seven years ended and there was a famine and he gave food to everybody. Okay. Ta da! Good. Next page. But the Word of God is not like any other book, it is spiritually inspired and it was designed that way by God. And everything that we see as we're going through, I guess you can see that, right? This is God as the author working through human pens, if you will. In the beginning, verse 47, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. And so he gathered up all the food of the seven years who were at the end, uh, in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up every, in every city the food of the fields which surrounds them. Then that makes sense. So you'd have a local food pantry. And Joseph gathered much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. I mean, that's a lot of grain. Joseph's on a mission. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do. The Lord reveals this thing to Pharaoh. Pharaoh charges him and says, this is who you are. You're on a mission from God. How many of you know that you're on a mission for God? Amen. Otherwise... You'd get saved, you ask Jesus into your life, you'd ask him to be your savior, forgive you of your sins and repent, and the Lord would just take you home. You would just, your clothes would just fall in a lump on the floor and you'd be out of here. But that's not what the Lord has for us, is it? Interesting, I, I collect sayings. Outstanding people have one thing in common, an absolute sense of mission. That was written by Zig Ziglar, so if you know who that is, um, I... I read a lot of things uh, next to the Bible and I tend to pick these things up. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Without God revealing to you what you should be doing, you're gonna be lost. Without understanding what God wants from your life, you're just gonna wander trying to find some purpose or some meaning or some joy or some contentment in things. Amen? Amen? It's without that revelatory communication from God that's going to make us get lost and we're going to go astray. So I would encourage each one of you, if you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, if God speaks to you and you walk with him on a daily basis, you should know what you're doing and where you're going. Because if you don't, you're going to waste a whole lot of time. If you don't know what God's will for your life is, he is wanting to tell you. In fact, it's probably one of the reasons you're here today to hear what I just said. If you have any trouble with that or you want to discover, come and speak to myself or my wife and we'd be glad to pray with you and counsel with you. But being on a mission is a very different thing than just living your life carefree. Stephen Covey, who you might know, says the most effective way I know to begin with the end in mind is to develop a personal mission statement or philosophy or creed. It focused on what you want to be and do and on the values or principles upon which being and doing are based. That sounds like a pretty good idea, right? You know, they do this in businesses all the time. They got to figure out who their identity is, what it is they're going to do, what they're not going to do, and all of those things define who they are. What is it you're actually aiming for? And it's certainly more than just having a certain dollar value placed next to your stock name, right? And it's important for businesses because if a business doesn't have that, then they're just going to do whatever, you know? You're going to find, you know, like Home Depot. Well, what's, what's your point? 
Well, the, the point is you want to have everything under one roof, everything the customer needs. It used to be you'd go to a lumber yard for lumber, you'd go to a hardware store for hardware, you'd, go, you'd have to go all these, you'd go to a kitchen place for kitchens. You go all these different places. Home Depot, the mentality is get everything under one roof, make sure we've got obnoxious amounts of it so that you could do any job that you want and we'll take care of the customer in all of these departments. Well, it doesn't quite do that anymore because some accountant actually inherited the company and decided, you guys carry way too much inventory. So let's empty those overheads, guys. Let's make sure we don't have enough shingles for the contractor to do three houses. And guess what happened? They lost their vision. Their mission was off. And suddenly they got somebody else called Lowe's that rose up and suddenly they, but they're doing the same thing because most businesses are run by accountants Anyway, so that's my small commercial (laughs) on what not to do when you lose your vision or when you don't have a mission. Understand what it is that you're about. Understand because you're going to be able to say no to a whole bunch of things. As a pastor of this church, I have to realize my primary responsibility are you people. I preach the word. Sometimes I fill in with worship and I do a lot of counseling during the week. And I love that. And discipleship. I love that. If there's anything else outside of this building that wants to come in and take the place of that, I have to say no, because I know my mission. I have a vision from God as to what I'm supposed to do, and it's very clear. Did you know that our church has a mission statement? You know what it is? You're just assuming we do, I know. Making fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. We make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. How are you going to do that? Well, that's, that's your mission statement. How you're going to do that, what your values are, the process by which. And number one is we do a line by line study through the scriptures. So you're not going to necessarily hear any political conversations. You're not going to hear uh, my opinions week after week on the same thing. We're going to look at the scriptures. So it's important to be effective. You have to have a mission. You have to have a vision. And without which the people will perish. I got another one from Stephen Covey, just because he's good. A mission statement is not something that you write overnight, but fundamentally, your mission statement becomes your constitution, the solid expression of your vision and values. It becomes the criterion by which you measure everything else in your life. So if there's something else that's going to stand in the way of that, now we've just declared our mission statement by taking communion. You realize that? I dedicate myself to the one who gave his body and he gave his blood. And Lord, I give you my body, I give you my blood in return. And it's, it's a really bad return for him, but he doesn't mind. But that's what he asks of us. And so we make a covenant with God every time we remember that. We say, Lord, I recommit myself to you. And it dictates everything that we do, or it should, shouldn't it? Sometimes we get lost because without a vision, my people perish. So do you have a vision of what God's plan for your life is? Like Joseph did. Are you on mission to accomplish that? I know for a long time, my mission and goals in life had to sit over here while I did other things. And I can tell you that's very frustrating. Can I get an amen? Amen. When you know the Lord wants you to do something, but you're doing something else, it's very frustrating. And yet... There are good things that happen there, just like with Joseph in prison. And Joseph, to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh or Manasseh. And God has made me forget my toil of my father's house. And the name of the second is called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I don't know about you, but naming your kids says a lot about you. Don't you think? If you named your kid garbage. That, that certainly says something more, more about you than it does about the kid, right? So Manasseh means forgetfulness. What's he trying to forget? 
all the toil in his father's house. It's interesting. It's a, it's forgetfulness. I'm going to call this son forgetfulness because he's going to make me forget all of the hardship, the toil, the difficulty in my father's house. All of my brothers who wanted me dead. My father who didn't even believe my dreams. My mother who's not even spoken of. They took my coat. They soaked it in blood and told my dad I'm dead. Those are, those are some heartless dudes. And instead of holding that bitterness, he names his son forgetfulness. Because I'm going to forget what happened. I'm going to let it go. You know, forgetfulness is a choice. It's not just old age syndrome. Forgetfulness, you choose to forget. You choose to let go. You choose not to rehearse it over and over. You choose not to hold on to it. And Joseph is telling us something about his heart. He's healing. And part of it is in the name of his first son, Manasseh, or Menashe. His name is Forget About It. <laughs> I wonder if he had a daughter, if maybe he'd name her Amnesia. <laughs> That's like a good girl's name. But you see, he's naming his son and saying, I'm going to forget. I'm, I'm, I'm going to sink my teeth into being a dad, and I'm going to forget about being a son who was cast aside, being a brother who was hated. And I think that's very telling of him. So he's got, forget about it. And then there's Ephraim, which is fruitfulness. And he says, I have been fruitful. God has caused me to be fruitful in my affliction. So now he's going to forget about Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, being in jail, the forgetful baker. I mean, he could have them all lined up and say, hey, see these people? Put them in jail. Ha, 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 ha. But he doesn't. You don't hear a word of it. So he's going to be forgetful about his father's house. And he realizes God has called him to be fruitful in his affliction. It's interesting. He's not forgetting that he was unfairly charged and went to prison. He's just choosing to remember God over the top of it. That God has caused me to be fruitful. Look where I am. Look what I'm doing. And he doesn't use it for unrighteous means. And so he calls him Ephraim or Ephraim, which means fruitfulness. So we'll call him success. So he's got forget about it and success. Pretty good names. By the way, um, that's a real sign as you're leaving Brooklyn. That's a real sign. And that's a real sign too. Yeah, anybody, you know where success is? Of course you don't. It's in Arkansas. Nobody knows. So anyway, I get very distracted when I put these studies together. It's interesting when he names his sons, they become Ebenezer stones. And if you know anything in first Samuel, there's this Ebenezer stone that gets set up by Samuel and it's a stone of remembrance. Um, you know, you guys all probably think of Ebenezer Scrooge and you think, why would you name your kid Ebenezer? That's a terrible thing. But he actually has a good, he's got, he's got a good thing that happens at the end. So, but Ebenezer is to be a remembrance stone or stone of remembering. And Samuel says, the Lord has helped us thus far. In other words, it's kind of a mile marker. God helped us at this time. They were calling on the Lord and repenting and a bunch of their enemies actually came in the Amalekites. And so they fought them off and God gave them great victory and they set up the stone to remember the great victory. I wonder, do you guys have any stones of remembrance? I hope you do. Some people like to journal. They write things in a journal and that becomes like a stone of remembrance because you can look back on it and say, I remember when I was totally torn up about this thing and God answered my prayers. I remember when I was in the midst of this. I remember when we didn't have groceries in the refrigerator. I remember when we just had condiments hanging on the door and there was nothing on the shelf. I remember, <laughs> you don't care what I remember. I, we went to a farmer's market and bought a bag of barley and uh, made some soup out of it because it was cheap. And as we're eating and all the barley was kind of cooked and, and floating and, and me and my wife and my kids are eating, I realized that it was really a bowl full of bugs. And I kept my head down and I kept eating it. 
And my daughter goes, Mom, are those bugs? I said, don't worry about it. Keep eating. Because <laughs> my wife is going to burst into tears as soon as she finds out that she cooked us bugs. It was barley, but it was full of bugs. Little worms. So I just kept eating. And my wife said, let me see that. Wait, oh, what is that? Is that a piece of barley? Is that the skin? And the oh, my goodness. There's hundreds of them. Whoop, whoop, whoop. You know, it's like a, like a terrible movie. And she takes it away from my daughter. Don't eat that. And she goes to take it away from me. I keep my thumb on it. It's all right. And of course, she was very distraught. And we didn't really have anything else. I remember those things. And I should remember those things every time I eat. Amen. Say, Lord, you have brought me this far. And I'm going to remember it every single, every single spoonful. I'm going to be grateful. I can tell you everything I ate yesterday. Because <laughs> I was grateful for it and I committed it to memory. <laughs> Ephesians 4.20 gives us some good, careful instruction. But you have not learned, so learned Christ. Indeed, you have heard him and have been taught in him as the truth is in Jesus that you should put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. That's what Joseph's doing. He's naming his children significant names because he's leaving the things that went behind and they are not going to dictate to him what he's going to do or how he's going to live or how he's going to feel or the lens by which he will see everything through. He's putting that off and he's remembering God. Each one of us can stand to do that, huh? To remember him, even in our hardship and in our affliction, our difficulties. So every time he calls Manasseh, or every kind he calls Ephraim, he'll be remembered. Are there wrongs that you have suffered that you should forget? Are there things that you should just put off? Maybe in your father's household, things that happened in your childhood. Are there things that have happened at workplaces where you've been hurt? There are a lot of Christians who get hurt at churches, which is unfortunate, but people... People can be damaging to other people. And it's just the nature. It's not God's way, but it is sometimes the way of people. Are there things that we should forget? I imagine we all have at least one thing that the Lord might be speaking your heart about right now that you can just forget. And are there things in your life that you can be more thankful for? Things that maybe you take for granted. Maybe a person. Maybe a place. Maybe a thing. Joseph's doing that. He's doing the right things. Colossians chapter three, Paul writing to the church of Colossae, he says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, by the way, those are the parts of your body, which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off these Anger, wrath, malice, which is pre-planning evil on someone, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds and you have put on the new man who was renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. So there are a whole bunch of things we need to offload. We need to empty out our storage containers 
of things that we shouldn't be holding on to so that God can do a greater work in our hearts so we can be more thankful. Amen? Amen. Make room. That's okay. I'm going to step. So, are there wrongs that you've suffered that you should forget and be more thankful for? I did it twice, sorry. Verse 53, picking up with the story. And then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended. Because it always does, doesn't it? And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph has said. The famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And then Pharaoh said what every famous politician says. Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. <clears throat> so he's suddenly going to take up the mantle of doing a completely different job. Instead of being an architect and building these giant silos and collecting taxes from everybody, now he's got to actually give it out. So he's going to go in the opposite direction. Famine always comes into our lives. You know that? Want, difficulty, hardship. You know, when you're wondering how you're going to make that bill or repair the car or it's always going to come. It always does. And there's a good reason for it. It causes us to reconnect with the Lord on a deeper level, doesn't it? So Lord, I, your car's broken. In First Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Amen. You know, we forget that the Lord cares for us and we don't want to bother him. If you're like me, it's like, Lord, I don't want to bother you. Or if you're like all the other people that come to my office when they happen to be sitting in my chair. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I hate to bother you. I tell him, I, I hate for you to bother me too. But you'll have to try harder because I'm not bothered. <laughs> Listen, I, I believe that there are all of these wonderful appointments that you just didn't know about. Like cars breaking down. Like people coming in my office. I just assume that you're an unscheduled appointment that God knew about and he didn't tell me. Amen. It says that we're to humble ourselves before God in times like this and cast our cares on him because he cares for us. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? By the way, a cubit's 18 inches. You're not going to get that even from a chiropractor. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What should we drink? When will he be done so we can go have fellowship? <laughs> or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knows that you need these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about tomorrow when you get there. Tomorrow's got enough worries. You don't need to steal from tomorrow and, and take it upon yourself today, which is what you do whenever you put something on credit. You steal from tomorrow. Anyway, but I digress. Jesus tells us not to worry. It's a time for dependence. And if you're going through a difficult time and a hardship, it's time to really draw close to the Lord and figure out why. And it's an opportunity to grow deep in a relationship with him. So it reminds me of Mary. If you remember what Mary said in John chapter two, 
If you remember the story, Jesus and his disciples, along with Mary and his family, all go to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And so they, they all show up and it's a week long party, okay? And they run out of wine. Apparently they didn't expect Jesus to come with 12 disciples. They ran out of wine. And Jesus goes up to, Mary goes up to Jesus and said, Jesus, they're out of wine. It sounds like an innocent enough question. Just reporting gossip. But he knows that she means something more than that. Because he's something more than just a man. He knows what she's trying to say. Like, hint, hint, elbow, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You could do something about this. That's the Jersey version. And he says, woman? And he calls her woman. He doesn't say mom, mommy. He doesn't call her nothing uh, of, of a kind nature. He just says woman. What does that have to do with me? Now, that sounds awfully heartless of Jesus. She wanted her son to kind of show everybody that she's not really an, a, a mother who bore a child out of wedlock, who was pregnant out of wedlock. I think she was looking for vindication of herself. Jesus said, what does that have to do with me, woman? It's not my time yet. And Mary turns, and these are the only words you're going to hear from Mary. His mother said to his servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Which is exactly what Pharaoh said about Joseph. Whatever he says to do, you do it. You know, there are some places that make very large of Mary. And I would encourage those folks to do what she says. <laughs> whatever he says to you, do it. Mary points to Jesus and says, whatever Jesus says, you do it. So if you're, if you're liking Mary, two thumbs up on Facebook, <laughs> you should do whatever Jesus says, because Mary said so. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 15 says, in this manner, therefore pray. And Jesus tells us how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, or holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, or our sins. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And then there's the subtext. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's interesting, Jesus rolls out what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really a disciple's prayer. And he says, oh yeah, and by the way, and I imagine he was speaking to somebody individually, if you don't forgive sins, God's not gonna forgive yours. I wonder if that was like an aside for somebody. You know, Jesus singled out Peter. He said, by the way, Peter, <laughs> you know, that, that's for you too, that prayer. If we're to do what Jesus says, this should be the way we pray. Maybe not word for word exactly like this, but the content of it and the structure of it, I think it is good. I wonder how often we remember that. And it's interesting, it begins with our father. Not my father. He's our father. The very first word includes all you people. Our father. So it's not just my personal God, and you know, I don't know who you know. He's our father. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it's deep and it's rich. If we're going to do as Jesus says, then we should probably pray this way. Do you know who to go to when difficult times come? The people in Egypt knew. Pharaoh told them, go to Joseph. God the Father says, go to Jesus. So you know who to go to. Do you know how to come to him? in the prescribed way in which he tells us to pray. Our 
Father. And we come and beseech him as our Father. So the famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. The famine became severe in the land of Egypt so that all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. So it was a big deal and it says that he sold to the Egyptians, but not, not just to the Egyptians, everybody who had need. Do you know this place is open to everybody that has need? Much like this, because Jesus is the bread of life and he asks us to come to him. By the way, this is a picture of one of the depositories of Joseph that Joseph built. Like I said, it's just south of Cairo. And right behind it, and if you think that place is big, look at the pyramid behind it. This was all built by Joseph. And if you go through and look at the history, he also has another name, which is called Imhotep. So if you check that out, it's rather interesting. And there are all sorts of carvings and writings all about Joseph and writing this and pictures of granaries and people getting the grain out. And it was ingenious the way they did it. They had all of these places where you would put the grain and the grain would come out at the bottom. So they had them all linked into one chute and they would have to go deep into the ground because that's where they kept it because it kept it cool. It's just amazing when, uh, when you look at the architecture of it. Sorry, I couldn't uh, take you for a trip through Egypt, but um, you can feel free to look that up online. Malachi 3.10 says this, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. I will, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The Lord was challenging the people to bring the things that they had committed to bring into the house of God so that God would bless them, the givers. And it's funny how God does that. If you're faithful to do what the Lord's called you to do, the Lord will bless you. And if you don't, it's really to your own hurt. And I think, what if the people were stingy for those seven years of plenty? If they were stingy and said, no, I'm not, I'm not, bring, I'm not bringing anything, forget it. Where do you think they'd be in those lean years, the seven lean years of famine? They'd be in deep stuff, yeah. And I, I thank God that we have a place here where people in their richness and in their obedience to Christ are making deposits into our account financially and with their backs and with their sweat. And that's what makes this such a great place for other people because there are other people going through famine. There are other people going through difficult times. And this church helps a bunch of people that you, you will never know about because we do it like the Lord does in secret. And I know a lot of you good people are very generous and you find out that there's a need here and you take care of it. And I'm blessed to be here. I'm blessed to see you guys encourage my heart in doing that. But not everybody has enough. Not everybody has what they could. And doing that is like being the hands of Jesus and speaking love to them in a way that I'm not sure anything else can. When the famine was all over the face of the earth and Joseph opened the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. And so all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. I think about Jesus in the storm as he was walking on the water. These guys were in deep, deep trouble. They were trained fishermen who were saying, we're going to die. It's all over. And they were rowing and rowing and rowing. In fact, they rowed into the wee hours of the morning and they were only halfway across the Sea of Galilee because the wind was against them. And Jesus came down from the mountain where he was and he went across to them and he walked them on the water in a storm. And they were all afraid because they thought he was a ghost. He says, no, it's me. And Peter said, oh yeah? Well, if it's you, then ask me to get out of the boat and walk to you. Almost not believing. <laughs> I think he was unbelieving. And Jesus said, come. That's all he said. He gets out of the boat and he walks on water just like Jesus did. 
until he looks around and he sees what's going on. He goes, this is impossible. And down he goes. And the Lord reaches out and calls him up and rescues him and puts him in the boat and said, what happened? You had faith. You were here. Why did you stop believing? And he reaches down. It's interesting how Joseph becomes the savior of the world at that point in time, just like Jesus did. And it's a foreshadowing of the Christ who would come, of somebody who would have enough. In fact, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He's speaking spiritually, of course. So I wonder, do you know that Jesus wants you to come to him? That his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Whether it's a spiritual unsettledness, whether it's a financial unsettledness, or whether you just watch too much CNN, (laughs) you can come to Jesus and he will bear the burden of whatever it is that you're carrying and he can take it away. Like Manashe and Ephraim, you can have stones of remembrance where you can look back and remember the day that you laid it at his feet. And if you haven't come into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, you can do it today by confessing what a terrible sinner you are, just like the rest of us. Amen? Amen. And how we all need a savior. We need forgiveness of our sins and we need regeneration from the inside out. Next week, there's gonna be a family reunion and it's rather complicated, but hopefully we'll go through it. And um, if, if, I, if I don't get stuck, we'll actually go through the whole chapter. Mm-hmm. So pray for me. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and we'll do one more song for you.